getting to order. And our our valiant um, leader, uh, Helen Reilly, is hopefully having a wonderful time with family um, out on Lake Champlain herself. So we are very fortunate to have such um, wonderful resources and and opportunities to to find relaxation not too far from home. So I am acting as chair in her stead, and I will do my best. So the first order of the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm. I, I know that when we're online, we normally skip that. So Jesse, I see you agreeing with that. So we will all know that we are here for a purpose and uh, we will continue on then. And, and thank you. Soon, I believe next month, we will be able to be in a room with a flag and we will be able to give the pledge. All right, next order is the agenda review. Does anybody have any additions? Deletions. This conference will now be recorded. Or change the right. order of the agenda items. All right, I see none. Very good. So the comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. Is anyone here who would like to make a comment? Hello, I would. Thank you, Nola. Are you Nola yeah. Scott, the name that we see on your screen? Yes, um, my name is Nola Scott. I'm a student at the University of Vermont. Sorry, I'm all red in the face. I just got off of work. Um, no worries. But I wanted to make some comments about the environment and what the city of South Burlington is doing right now for them, for it. Um, I kind of came into this a little late. I don't have much kind of prepared in my head, but just that I am very worried and scared about how my life will be affected by the environment and that's selfish but based on how things are going i think it could get really bad i think it is already getting really bad i'm scared from the future of my life the future of my friends my family future generations i'm sure most of you probably feel the same way because we're all humans on this earth and we all have to deal with the environment we are all a part of the environment um and i I would like to see the city of South Burlington and Burlington as a whole doing more um, because this is my home now, has been for a year, and I see it being my home for a lot longer as well. Um, and I care about it a lot, but I also care about the entire earth. And I think we can do a lot more in the local area that will make a much bigger difference everywhere else because individual action, I don't know, I've struggled with this a lot of trying to be vegetarian, be vegan, compost, use like beeswax wrapper paper and all of that is good and great. And obviously not everyone has access to do those things, but to have the city that we live in, the state we live in, the country we live in, to also be addressing that, but on a much larger scale is really important. And just, yeah, um, there is a quote that I, would like to read um that is um by far the biggest obstacle we are up against is hopelessness a feeling that it's all too late we've left it too long and we'll never get the job done on such a short timeline but the truth is that there are tens of thousands of people who have been quietly building local models and road testing policies for how to put justice at the center of our climate response now we protect forests generate renewable energy design public transit and much more and that's from On Fire by Naomi Klein. Um, and I think that's just a quote that kind of exemplifies how important working in your locality is and the way to make big changes to start at a small level. Um, and yeah, thank you for letting me speak. Um, and I hope that the city of South Burlington will continue to work for the climate and work towards more climate justice. Um, maybe not paving over meadows, planting more trees, not cutting down as many trees. Um, there are lots of things, so thank you. Thank you, Nola. Very much appreciate your comments. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak before we start? All right, well, 
seeing nobody else, and that was um, really well said, too. I want us to move on to the announcement and city manager's report. And I will see Matt there, who's on vacation on South Hero. Maybe you have other things to report uh, other than you look relaxed. Uh, I have uh, nothing to report. We uh, The GMT meets uh, uh, tomorrow morning, and I'll have something to report at the next meeting, though. Fabulous. Thank you. And Tim? I don't think I have anything. Thank you. Right. Tom? Just say I went to Sobu Night Out on Thursday, and it was a great crowd, great music, great time. Really uh, love seeing those continuing. I think I saw you in the distance there, Tim. So uh, I just love Sobu Nights Out as much as I don't like Sobu. Um, I love the Sobu night out, so it's good stuff. And I attended uh, the um, kind of soft or, or sneak peek opening, I guess, yesterday uh, for donors to the South Burlington Public Library and heard from Jay Pasikow, who's the president of the Library Board of Trustees, um, in addition to Nancy Simpson, who spoke on behalf of herself and her husband, um, and of course, uh, Jennifer Murray, our library director, um, all of them gave really moving, moving just tes testimonies about uh, the long uh, journey it's been, but to a really great moment. And I think it was Jay who said that um, he was, I think, um, uh, repeating comments that Emily, the children's librarian, had, had given to the press about how with the reopening of our community here, hopefully it will remain <laughs> moving positively uh, after this long 18 month period of, of being closed in, that this is a really good time for us to open our library. And I thought it was a really, um, really nice event and made a Townsend oh, our House rep our House representative did a very nice job emceeing there. So I just wanted to report that to all. I encourage everybody to head out to the library. And the grand opening is this Friday, beginning at 4.30, lasting till 8. It's going to be community party. So after Sobu night out on the Thursday, we can head on over to the library. And they're going to be blocking off Market Street right there in front. And there will be all kinds of events there as well. So. With that, we'll hand it over to Jessie. I know she's got other things to, to announce. Yes, thank you, Megan. Um, so a couple of updates on my end, starting with some logistics for the council. Um, well, first, it was a very exciting day for city staff today. We officially moved into 180 Market Street. The library has been moving for a few weeks, but um, planning and zoning staff, city clerk staff, and, and city hall staff moved over today. It was a Great day of unpacking, getting our um, internet, our office setups um, up to speed. Uh, thank you, Council, for your patience with some email connectivity issues in the last few days as the servers moved over. Um, but we're really excited. We're really excited to uh, fully move in and welcome everybody to the grand opening on Friday, as Megan said. Um, just a quick, again, logistics for the council. We will have a special city council meeting on the 23rd, right before the grand opening at four o'clock for the purposes of approving the warrant and setting the municipal tax rate so we can get bills out into the mail um, given the reappraisal timeline. Um, additionally to that, I would ask that you come in a few minutes before that to sign the resolution that you previously approved for Jennifer Kochman so we can hang it in the library with your actual in-person signatures for the grand opening. I'll put that all in an email, but I want to remind you of those things. Um, we are optimistic that the August 2nd council meeting will be held in the new auditorium at 180 Market Street. We're still fine tuning the commissioning of the AV system in there. So there is a chance that we will be um, in that building, but not in that space. Um, so more to come. We're really excited to uh, show off that great new space. Um, on to other city updates. Um, Wanted to remind the community and the council that the Muddy Brook Culvert Replacement Project is moving forward. Um, that is the Kimball and Marshall Ave uh, 
huge culvert. Most people think it's a bridge connecting over to Williston. Um, that will be closed starting Monday, August 2nd. Uh, we do have signboards up now advertising that. Um, it is a very aggressive construction schedule and we are really hoping uh, to have it done this construction season to remove that bridge and put in the new very significant culvert. Um, and we will be doing a pretty significant press push on that early next week. Um, if folks are interested in uh, more updates of that project along the way, they can go to the stormwater website, sbrillstormwater.com, um, and then there's a Muddy Brook culvert replacement uh, project page there. We will be pushing that out through all of our media as well. Um, I shared with the council, but wanted to share with the community as well. Um, on Friday, the UVM Health Network submitted um, a conceptual certificate of need, um, a CON as they call it, to the Vermont Green Mountain Care Board, asking the board to allow them to proceed with planning for a new um, outpatient surgery center. Um, my understanding is that surgery center would be at Tilly Drive and would add um, a lot of access to health services within South Burlington, not to mention great economic um, job opportunities. Obviously much more to come on that, um, but we are excited about their investment in South Burlington. And then finally, I wanted to give the council a quick update that um, Andrew is doing first round interviews this week for um, our next city attorney. We've gotten some really amazing um, candidates um, and we hope to finish first interviews this week, second interviews over the next two weeks with the um, goal of making an offer by August 6th. So more to come on that front, but wanted to give you that update. Thank you very much. Very good. Quick quick question. Yes, Tim. Um, Jesse, when will the um, the big uh, LED signs go? Will they put a big LED sign up at Kimball and, and Airport? I mean, uh, Kimball and Kennedy, like they did when the bridge washed out, you know, like warning people that it'll be out in August. Okay. Yes, those are actually up now. I noticed them when I was driving okay. over here to 19 Gregory Drive tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There are also, just so folks are aware, um, there are also similar similar signage right now on Market Street announcing the closure of Market Street Friday night, just so folks are aware of that detour as well. And there was a tweet by the Public Works today that they were closing the bridge as well. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. All right, well, thank you very much, Jesse. And we are now gonna go on to our consent agenda where we have a whole slew of minutes uh, from three dates, March 29th, April 5th, and May 25th of this year. So if there's somebody who would like to make a motion to approve those minutes. Don't jump in all at once. So moved, I make a motion to approve the minutes as in, in our packet. I was on move second. Very good, and any discussion? All right, very good. All in favor, please state aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And I, nobody abstained, right? I think everybody voted. I didn't hear Tom, but I thought I saw his mouth move. <laughs> All right. Very good. And now we're going to move on to item number six, which is, which is the resolution for policymaking to reduce carbon emissions and counteract climate change. And I am going to be leading this discussion. Um, as you all know, it was two meetings ago, Helen Reilly brought forward um, an amendment and we did some uh, work on it actually during the meeting and it hasn't, I don't think, changed much since then other than um, the Energy Committee, instead of being the committee tasked with this, uh, would like to, to be one of the committees considered as we make a new committee to task. Um, Paul Connor also addressed um, the, the process, and this is in one of the, the therefore clauses, I believe it's the, the last one, and um, where, uh, sorry, it's the second to last one. Um, nope, it's the, the first one, I'm sorry, the second, the second be a further resolve clause. Um, the city staff and the council will immediately task a committee. Um, Paul had talked about a committee that would have a broad base of representation and there would be more than one staff member staffing it, uh, as I recall. Um, and so this is something that we would um, take up at a, at a future council meeting. Um, we also have um, the important work of 
uh, taking actions based on the Climate Action Plan uh, with the help of its advisory committees. Um, and of course, that goes into all kinds of branches of our work, whether it be preparing and adopting regulations, preparing capital budgets and annual work programs, and forming citizen committees as needed. Um, and finally, we would be reporting annually, and this would be city staff, um, on the progress that the city is making on enacting the Climate Action Plan. And, and that, as we all know, uh, the four of us and, and Helen as well, it's always good to, to measure exactly where we are uh, and if we're making progress, progress and if we're meeting our goals. So that's an important part of this resolution as well. And so I am opening the floor here for some discussion. I know we have received some comments online and I'm gonna first hear from you all, but I'm prepared to, to talk about what I've heard from, from some community members as well. Any discussion? I can start us off, Councillor Emery. Oh, sorry, thank you, Tim. <laughs> yes, thank you. Go ahead, please, Tom. So again, this is important to so many community members and I think it's worth our time. Uh, I will say this version is moving in the right direction. I, I have two comments and I uh, I would offer that the, um, the last be it resolved and this somewhat connects with what we heard from Marcy. Uh, she commented that we need more clarity as to who's reporting to who. Uh, and I would, I would propose that for the last be it resolved that the city will annually report on the progress that the city is making what if we ask the chief sustainability officer, which I believe is still Paul Connor, to report to the city council? That, that gives greater clarity. And uh, we have annual reports. Uh, we hear from our auditing auditor. We hear from uh, all of the uh, nonprofits. So I think it makes sense to give a specific task to somebody that has been designated that responsibility. Uh, the other comment I'll make, and I, I made this the last time we discussed it, and it's not a, a, a showstopper for me, but in the second be it resolved, I, I just they involve all members of the community to participate. We can't get all members of the community to vote. So I, I just like that that phrase keeps uh, keeps I keep stubbing my toe on the the involve all members of the community to participate. It just doesn't seem feasible. But again, it's not a showstopper for me. I just I don't see how that could ever possibly happen. Those are my comments. What what if I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead, please, Matt. Uh, uh, what if it were. I, I sort of implied that involved meant invite, meaning inclusive of all, not not denying the ability of anyone to contribute to the discussion. Uh, would invite uh, Tom make Thomas make more sense than involve, or I don't know. Well, I think with the I'll let Tom respond, but with the public process, it is open to all members of the community, right? So. We, by having those meetings, are involving all members of the community. Um, they can choose to participate or not, um, but we are involving them by holding public meetings. So I'll, I'll just add that on to Matt's comment. And now, Tom, if you have. Yeah, again, it's not a showstopper, but Matt, I think I like invite. Invite makes more sense to me. Uh, I just I don't see how we can involve everybody, but maybe it's just we're semantics. And I, I have a different definition of involve in my mind. Mm -hmm. that, Helen's not here to say whether or not it's a friendly amendment. Does that sound like a friendly amendment to you, Tim? Um, it it does. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my video is fritzing out again. I'm going to go get another laptop, but uh, I can talk for now. But at the last meeting at the end, I, I think I lost my microphone as well. <laughs> um, no, that that's, yeah, I have a, I, I understand Tom's um, issue because it's hard to, uh, to, to sort of, you know, measure how you're going to involve everybody in the community. If there was some way to phrase that in a way where it seemed inclusive without, Making it mandatory, or or somehow, you know, imply that you know every every person has to be polled or whatever. Um, the the other issue is that it says to reduce electricity use, and I, I mean, I, it, that's part of energy usage. But the problem is that if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, um, sometimes you have to convert over to heat pumps, and you will be actually increasing your electricity usage uh, for a while, at least until something else comes along. So I. 
but but I get I get the sense of what it is, which is trying to reduce all energy usage. Period. But that that's not a, a, a showstopper for me anyway. I just I wanted to to point that out. Okay. All right. I'll I'll add here that um, uh, there's also I think a really good comment from a member of the community in the third. Uh, be it resolved um, that when there is the reporting from the chief sustainability officer, I, I'm in favor of that as well, um, that it's just the last clause to reflect this mission, um, that that reflect this mission would be followed by, by using standard tools and metrics, that there would be uh, just a, a way to measure uh, whether or not we're meeting those goals, whether or not we're, we're meeting uh, you know, the kind of the, the steps that uh, we have set out. And this is something that I think is really important for any organization is to give themselves goals and then just kind of put, you know, into place markers so that we know how to reach those goals. And are we making those goals? How can we calibrate? How can we, I think it's, it's useful just to have that kind of uh, precision that there will be, you know, perhaps graphs, perhaps, <laughs> right? Something that we can we can see. Are we really meeting those goals? Is that something you all could live with? Sure, for me, speaking for myself, yeah. I, I appreciate the, the work that Helen put into, uh, you know, crafting a sort of a compromise resolution. It, it it hits all the points that I think the, that I was trying to make in previous meetings and and tightens things down and becomes you know action oriented. So I appreciate her work and anybody else that contributed it to it. Thank you. Rosanne, you've turned on your your camera, so please feel free to yeah, speak. Yeah, no, I'm gonna. I, I, I didn't know if you I were can, ready for the public yet. Uh, I can still. Oh. I, I'm, uh, I don't want to miss input, but let me just go. You folks keep going. I'm going to grab another laptop. I'll be back. Okay. Are you ready for the public, Megan? I don't want to uh, jump over the yeah. council. Yeah, I think Tim said okay. I think he might um, have said that he wanted to hear you too. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what I uh, some of this is just grammatical. Um, in the first be it resolved, it says uh, you'll seek a committee to work with the C CCRPC and the Vermont Climate Council, the Vermont Climate Council's Climate Action Plans. I don't think you want to work with plans. I think you want to work with people. Uh, or or maybe you are thinking you're working with the plans or, right. or aligned with the plans. It just seemed a, a, just a strange uh, wording. but. I think it's to implement them. So, so it's the to work with. That maybe it's the verb that. Yeah, it says to work with the CCRPC. That makes sense, and the Vermont Climate Council's Climate Action Plans. And then the next is the involved, which I actually I think invite all people is a better than involved because. You can't okay. possibly involve anybody, but but it's it's working with the plans is if that was the intent, okay. But I, it seemed like you're working with a group of people, you know, in the region. It, it makes sense you would want to work with the state entity, but maybe that's not what the intent is. I, I you know, well, I don't want to, I don't want to beat a grammatical horse here, but you know. Well, we could we could certainly say to task a committee to work with the CCRPC and the Vermont Climate Council. Yeah. on the climate action right. plans right if that's i mean that's just yeah i would think you want to work with the council yeah and the other uh wordsmithing that which i'll just throw in and, and then, then i have a substantive comment it's in the second be it resolved and it says that with the help of its advisory committees will strive to take action i hope you'll just take action not strive to take action <laughs> but take action um because actually that means you don't have to do anything you're just trying to do something so that's i'd make it more um action oriented um yeah, yeah. and uh i don't know if tim is back but um i can hear you okay all right so here's my substantive comment 
and it goes up to the first whereas, which I totally agree with, and that is the um, uh, number of key projects reducing our energy and carbon footprints. Uh, that's the whereas, and then <coughs> uh, adopt the reduction of South Burlington's carbon footprint as an extremely important effort for sure. Th this is my comment. There's two halves to addressing the climate crisis. One is to stop putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the second is to stop destroying the uh, parts of nature that absorb the carbon dioxide. So I, I know you were sent uh, an article, I read it uh, myself, it's called uh, The Cost of Delay. But in that, and this is something I, uh, I had learned when I read this, and it says, uh, I'm just gonna read a short part. I hope you all read it, but if you didn't, here's what it says. It said, until recently, natural carbon sinks which are primarily oceans and plants, absorb much of our CO2 admitted into the atmosphere. And it talks about 25% of the CO2 is dumped, that we dump in the atmosphere is absorbed by our oceans and another 25% um, is absorbed by um, plant and vegetative matter, like trees and grasses and soil. But it says, Without the and without these carbon sinks, the atmospheric CO2 levels would rise almost twice as fast as they have since the, the dawn of the industrial age. But as the world emits more CO2, these sinks are becoming saturated. And that means, and I'm reading this, that even if our CO2 emissions remain constant, the growth rate of the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere will continue to rise because the trees and the grasses and the soil can't take any more carbon. So if we're cutting down and mowing and uh, paving over these things, you're compounding it because you're reducing the elements of nature that take the carbon dioxide. So I, I urge you to look at the other part of it, you know, in the medical term, first do no harm, first stop cutting down trees, paving over meadows, because we need those vegetative matters to absorb the carbon. Uh, uh, so that's my substantive comment that I hope you would incorporate. And maybe the committee will incorporate it, but I think having it in the language would make it more powerful. I think the Paris Thanks. Agreement, the Paris Agreement, which we all have seen and, and we signed on to in 2017, includes the sinks and the reservoirs. Okay. So okay. Yeah. I think it is implied in that okay. first whereas clause. Okay. All right. I just wanted to emphasize it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other community members wish to speak up? Okay. So I saw, Jesse, I saw you writing. Did you catch all of the comments that were made, kind of the, the wordsmithing there? where instead of in the first, um, I guess the second, be it further resolved clause, that instead of involve, we would say invite all members of the community to participate in creating a plan with specific actions for South Burlington, et cetera. And then be it further resolved that the city staff and the council with the help of its advisory committees, um, I think we'll strive and I I can certainly say we'll act if you all want to take Roseanne up on. I like the word strive. I think it makes sense. It also implies, you know, that this is this is where we want to go. Um, but it doesn't uh, if failure doesn't mean we're legally culpable. And I, I think that by bringing in the measures, we'll know how well we're, we're acting. And that will, of course, invite the public to, to, to encourage us <laughs> to, 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 to strive harder or to act harder, right? More, more deliberatively. Um, so we'll strive to take actions based on the climate action plan. Um, I think I forgot, sorry, under the first be it further resolved that city staff and the council and back up to the first, be it further resolved, that the city staff and the council will immediately task a committee to work with the CCRPC and the Vermont Climate Council on 
the climate action plans because they each have one. All right. And then the last be it further, no. So then under be it further resolved, we'll strive to take actions based on the climate action plan by preparing and adopting regulations, preparing capital budgets and annual work programs and forming citizen committees as needed to reflect this mission by using standard tools and metrics to account for greenhouse gas emissions. So far so good, Jesse. And I'm sorry I jumped around there. And climate impacts when making any significant decisions. And then the final, be it further resolved, that the city's chief sustainability officer will annually report on the progress that the city is making on enacting the climate action plan and will verify that the city appropriately factors climate impacts into all applicable actions and decisions. On that point, Council Emery? Yeah. Um, I love what you just said. I would just also say maybe that the Chief Sustainability Officer will annually report on the progress to the City Council uh, that the City is making on enacting the Climate Action Plan. Uh, I just think that was the specificity Marcy suggested and that seems to make sense. Very good. Very good. All right, did I catch them all? And thank you, Tom. Okay, and Jesse, you got all of those too? All right, very good. So, so I'm one other, yes. Councillor, I'm, yes, no. sure, I'm not sure you can see me, so that's why I'm speaking up uh, when I raise my hand. Uh, I think Councillor Barrett mentioned the third uh, whereas is uh, something about the pursue energy efficiencies by, re it's in, whereas it is in the city's best interest to pursue energy efficiencies by reducing fossil fuel and electricity use mm -hmm. and or through electricity use. Um, is an and and an or through does that address your your point tim that if as we reduce fossil fuel we, we might see an increase in electricity use and that's not necessarily a bad thing so adding an and or through electricity use um maybe can you hear me yeah. yes okay so maybe we could uh try to get my camera to work but uh, i'm on a different machine uh maybe we could just um shorten it to um reducing uh, well, hmm. I, to, just to fill the void here while Tim thinks of the right word, I Go think ahead. the intent of the, and I'm not sure the, yeah. the, where it originated from, but I think the intent of it, whether it was Helen or Megan, um, is, is, is particularly when you're looking at thermal, um, that, you know, a third of the wasted energy is because the homes aren't weren't weatherized, you know, so the idea that even if the homes are electrified and they're all electric heat, you still need to do the work to weatherize them uh, in order to reduce energy consumption, be it electricity or natural gas or oil or, or renewable fuels of, or wood. Um, so I think that I think that's the what they're the intent of the language. So I understand the intent. I'm not sure. So I'm my proposal this, but... would be to to modify it slightly and say uh... Uh, it's in the city's best interest to pursue energy efficiencies and reduce fossil fuel consumption. I like that. That That's leaves fine. it open, right? Yeah. Good. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. All right. And I'm trying to get my camera. And Jesse, just kind of the mechanics of this. Can we also sign this on Friday when we meet to go over the warrant and sign Jennifer Kochman's resolution? Is that something? If we vote on it tonight, could we sign? Could we sign the the amended, you know, with the wordsmithing that you're doing there? Could we sign it on Friday as well? Absolutely. Megan. Yes. Hi, Marcy. this is Marcy. I don't, I don't have much signal, so I can't. Um put my camera on right now, but I'd just like to uh, mention two other things, if this is a good time to do that. Sure. Um, first of all, I think it's really important to put, uh, perhaps in the second resolved, uh, adding something like with the goal of completing the city's climate action plan within one year from this date. Um, otherwise, if we're waiting for the legislature and other external parties to get their plans together, this 
the plan could be years down the road and we really do need to act more quickly. So I think it would be helpful to have a goal of having the actual plan completed within one year and then implementation could start after that. What I would suggest for that is that that could be in the committee's charge. So when we task a committee, we would give them a charge and we would give them you know, a, a, a date at which just like we did with interim zoning, we gave the planning commission a date, right? And and then that was part of the, the charge, that was part of the, the motion. I, okay. I think how does that sound to you, Marcy? Yes, that sounds that sounds good. Thank you. And secondly, I just uh in the second whereas, I know it mentions quality of life. I think it's important also to just you know to emphasize the seriousness of this to also add um, the effect on quality of life, health, and economic well-being, as well as safety. I mean, climate change can have, um, if it continues as it's going, would have effects on all those things: health, safety, and uh, economic well-being, as well as the quality of life that's listed in the current resolution. Is that something that the members of the council? I certainly acknowledge that. Thomas says yes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I just, and I agree with your, your first uh, response, uh, Megan, as well. I just want to put, uh, I thank Marcy for all of her input. I just want to push back on waiting around years for legislature. There's going to be a Vermont Climate Action Plan on December 1st of 2021. <laughs> um it's required by law um so i don't i don't think the state is going to be laggard in in, in this process but but i appreciate the comment marcy thank you okay so so you said quality of life health and economic uh quality of life health safety and economic well-being safety and economic well-being Under that second whereas clause. Okay, and Tim, you're okay with that too? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anything else? All right. All right. Well, I would be looking then for a motion to adopt this resolution. I would make a motion that we adopt the climate change resolution as amended tonight second hey megan yes jesse um just a friendly suggestion obviously it's your prerogative to approve if you want tonight um if you wanted you could direct me to enter in all these changes and then officially approve on friday night for with helen's signature on the resolution if she doesn't vote tonight she will not be no. a signatory on the resolution yeah. She will be there on Friday because she's speaking there. Okay. Yeah. Well, like that's that. kind of good suggestion, Jesse. Yes, I I like that suggestion I, as well. I I withdraw my motion. Or do we have to withdraw the second? Can we first? table? Could we just table the motion or just leave yeah. it open? Sure. sure. Yeah. We I have our motion, motion and second, and we will we will vote on Friday. And will it be public, Jesse? Will members of the public be able to? go and, and see this occur? Yes, I anticipate we will have this meeting right out in the front of City Hall in public and before the grand opening. Um, so folks will be able to, to um, attend and watch. Additionally, I will have this resolution as edited linked to the agenda that goes out later in the week. So folks can see the final version as discussed tonight. So, and I and I think that this answers what Nola Scott, the person who spoke to us during the public comment period, is getting at. I think this really does inspire people with hope. Uh, when people act, I, I think that that is the best way that we can move forward and and do it with hope. I think it's important, uh, just as she said. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Let us then move on to item number seven, and this is our consideration of a grant agreement. And we are early, but Travia is here early. 
she's been here all along, um, and funding source to support the Trinity Education Center's proposal to start the Infinite Center, a daily youth drop-in center and after-school program. And Jesse, you can lead us. You have a resolution put together, I believe. Yes, so thank you. Um, I'll kick this off and Dr. Childs, uh, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so per your direction at the last council meeting, um, staff went back to figure out the logistics of how to provide the seed money as requested for the um, Infinite Center. Uh, we recommend doing that through a grant agreement um, you know, uh, for, the, for fiscal year 22, that grant agreement is in your package. Dr. Childs has seen that grant agreement. Um, in that grant agreement, it outlines uh, the allocation of $10,500 is a one-time upfront payment to Dr. Childs and has some shared expectations about uh, what the city would do and what the center would do. Um, again, um, as, provide, as reviewed by Dr. Childs. Um, and, since that time, um, they have received an updated quote for insurance, um, and that quote is $500 more than we had previously thought. Um, so I think the request for tonight, and Dr. Giles, correct me if I'm wrong, is to actually up that grant agreement from 10,500 to 11,000 even to accommodate the intent of the council to pay for those related insurance costs. So that's the first part for your consideration. Do we award the seed money through a grant agreement? Um, the second part of this conversation is uh, how to, this is an unbudgeted expense for FY22. Um, so where to locate those funds um, and where the council could allocate those funds mid uh, fiscal year. Um, so our recommendation would be to take that 10,500 or $11,000 from our fund balance. It would leave a remaining 1.2 million in fund balance. So it's a very, very small hit to that. Alternatively, you could take it from your budgeted FY22 community services fund, um, but that would be a, that would be a very significant hit to that those allocated dollars, which would mean not funding other community services. Um, so those are the options we came up with. Obviously, it's the council's choice. Uh, our recommendation would be to um, allow us to enter into the grant agreement and to allocate the funds from FY21 fund or FY20 fund balance. Dr. Childs, did I miss anything big there? No, you did a great job. <laughs> All right, so we have the amount that's being requested, which is $11,000. We have our city manager's recommendation that we take this from our general fund balance. Is there any discussion among? Well, no, she's asking us which which fund we would want to take it from. I think that's up for discussion, right? And Thomas has his hand up. Tom, I'm not sure, Councilor Emery, if you can see my hand or not. So I'll start speaking up when uh, I want to speak. Uh, so I wasn't at the last meeting, and I just want to make clear that as a South Burlington alumni that got into a fair amount of trouble at the U Mall, I fully mm -hmm. support. Um, support of uh, bringing or uh, standing this program up. So I think this is exactly what the community needs. And these are kids in our, these are community members that are youths that are not uh, in, at school. So I think it falls on the city and I, I just wasn't at the last meeting and I wanna say uh, thank you to Dr. Childs for, for doing this. And I think it's a great thing. Uh, as for where the money comes from, I'm inclined to go with what is recommended by the city manager. Uh, so that's where I'd, I'd go, but I, I'm not seeing clearly enough what the trade-offs are in pulling it from the community services funds. Uh, I'm wondering if that just means uh, as those funds are needed, we would have to pull those from the fund balance. Uh, but again, I'm inclined to go with what the city manager recommends. Tim? Yeah, so I think that from the general fund is my preference because I want to leave the community funds intact because we have recipients that we've designated in the past. and I, I don't want to, we had a discussion about this a few meetings ago about how to handle those donations. So I, and I want to leave that intact. So from the general fund is, is great. And and I'm okay with $11,000. And I think this is an excellent thing to finance with a grant. And uh, I, I wish Dr. Childs uh, all the, the luck in, in getting this program going. And I hear there was some painting going on already too. Soon, yes, soon it will be. <laughs> Any other comments? I saw you nod, Matt, and yep. you have something. I concur with the previous comments, 11,000 general fund, and uh, best wishes and good luck, Dr. Childs. We, we, we support you. Jesse. So one other thing I did, I should have drawn, uh, 
drew your attention to, not drawn your attention, um, a suggestion Dr. Childs made for the grant agreement, which I think is a great one, is there is a shared expectation um, between the city, city council specifically, city leadership and the center to um, collaborate and, and engage leadership at the council and, and city staff um, level with the young people who participate in these programs um, as part of the leadership development portion of that um, of the programming. So just want to put it out there that you all will be invited to participate uh, with the young people as well and certainly city staff is very excited to do that as well. Just want well, to I think we should have a city council meeting there when it's, <laughs> when it's done. I think that's fabulous. I, I think that it is uh, something that we've already seen in our youth, that desire to be active participants in local government, that we have um, a 17 year old on uh, our one of our boards. Uh, I think that they really do want to participate and, and it would be great for us to, I think, uh, be familiar to them and, and for also our programming to uh, be able to somehow um, cross-pollinate with what Dr. Childs is going to be offering. And I just want to recognize Dr. Childs' generosity. This is a job. This is, um, as we all know as parents, this is a big job. And, and she is very willing to take this on. And that is uh, an act of generosity. And, and so we do wish you well, Dr. Childs. And uh, we are, as community members, here to support you, knowing that this is a nonprofit, just like all of our nonprofits that are local, giving so much to our community. So uh, we are here also as a resource. So just wanted to say that. Very good. And as, as long as um, everybody feels good about that, that agreement, um, I, that ninth, number nine, um, I, I certainly hope and expect that there will be no issues. Um, so is that is that a usual clause that we have in our contracts? Okay, very good. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. All right. Well, I am looking for a motion to approve uh, the use of $11,000 from our general fund balance and to enter into an agreement with Trinity Education uh, Center and their proposal to start the Infinite Center. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, I think that was unanimous. And again, a big thank you. And uh, we'll all be there <laughs> checking in and wishing you well. Thank you, Dr. Childs. All right. Now we have item number number eight, um, which is the council consideration and possible approval of an amendment to the old post approved entertainment license to allow for outdoor music. And we are very, very early here. I do see one person, two people, a few people I know wanted to speak. I'm curious if we should wait just a little bit because I know that this is uh, something that has a lot of public interest. And could we go on to perhaps the ARPA or are we throwing everything off by looking at item number nine? How do, how do people feel about that? You can table eight, go on to nine and come back to eight. Does that sound okay? Just to give people a great chance. Idea. So again, we're going to be hearing uh, this time from Andrew, um, our deputy city manager, and listening to him speak to us about the American Rescue Plan and how we will be incorporating um, new, I'd say, replacement hires, or um, we'll let Andrew explain to us, but using the, the federal funds in order to gain back some lost staff. Sure. Good. Good evening, counselors. Um, at a couple a meeting a couple a uh, couple times ago, a couple meetings ago, um, Jesse talked with the council around the possibility of using the 1.8 already allocated federal ARPA funds uh, towards possibly refunding 
at some of the seven um, unfunded positions um, that the city has for FY22. Um, these positions include um, city planner, parks laborer, benefits administrator, um, deputy finance offer, officer, a firefighter EMT, police officer, and an administrative assistant at the fire department. Um, Jesse and I had a few conversations with various department heads, as well as outgoing um, city manager Kevin Dorn and uh, deputy city manager Tom Hubbard, and uh, determined that probably the best, the most immediate needs um, would be to fund city planner, parks laborer, and sort of do a hybrid position for deputy finance officer and benefits administrator. Um, and so we are coming to you with a proposal of funding those three positions immediately with ARPA funding. Um, the cost of those alone is $257,872.28 estimated salary and benefits. Um, and in order so that does not uh, be a significant hit at the end of the five-year term that we have to use ARPA funds, um, I've created sort of a, a spreadsheet that shared with you in your packets around how that might work. So it would slowly be rolled in. The concept being that the general fund in year one, since it's unbudgeted now, would there'd be zero hit. In FY23, 20% and escalating all the way up to 100% for FY27. This makes the average annual general fund increases only around 60, 61, 62, thousand dollars a year um, and so that is the the general proposal um, recommendation um, if council agrees with this path forward um, would be to uh, approve this allocation and by a motion to assure that our um, uh, we've taken proper action pursuant to ARPA requirements thank you Andrew is there a discussion I'm looking at Tom, because that's true. I don't see your hand, Tom. I don't see his hand. Matt, did you have something you wanted to say? I I would just say that I agree wholeheartedly with the need for to bolster our planning staff. Uh, coming from the Development Review Board, I know how hard they all work and overworked sometimes. Um, so I'm supportive, definitely, of that, of that piece of it. Give them some support. I certainly I agree. agree there. Yeah. All right. We are sailing through this agenda, Jesse. <laughs> all right. This one's Any all Andrew. Sorry? This one's all Andrew. I take no credit for this sailing through this item. So yes, Tom. I will move to approve the allocation of ARPA funds as presented to refund three city staff positions beginning in FY twenty two. Second. And then uh, we're just going to do this every year, or is this a, doing the whole five-year plan? It's just every year we'll go through. Okay, very good. So this is just for year one for three positions. And I first from Tom, second from Matt. Am I right? If I can just clarify on that, Councillor Emery. So yes. with this vote, you are approving this plan to use the ARPA dollars this way. In future fiscal years, you will see that reflected in your budget approval, your annual budget approval but you won't necessarily re-vote on this plan. Very good, very good. Thank you for the clarification. All right, any other comments? Okay, so all in favor? No. Aye. 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 That was all of us, so I think that was unanimous. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you all. Okay, so. I think that we don't have very much cushion. Um, I think we're going to go on to uh, item number eight, then go back to that. And we will consider uh, an amendment to the old post approved entertainment license to allow for outdoor music. Uh, I know that we have some community members here. What I understood was that um, someone from the old post was going to be here. Is that person here, Jesse? 
to my knowledge, uh, Kim is not here. I don't see that name on our screen. If Kim, if you are here, please unmute. Um, I know we do have some folks on the screen who are uh, residents um, who may wish to be addressed. And then I did include in your packet a brief memo for the council outlining um, where in our ordinances you do have some rights to put conditions on um, on such a permit. Um, so if the council was interested as requested by the residents, you could limit the days of the week or the hours of operation uh, for this entertainment permit. That would just require a vote by the council. Very good. And maybe per, before we get into that, um, there was some concern about violation um, of the city ordinances. Do we have any word, any update on that? So we don't, I, we don't have a good update on that. The police, uh, after the last council meeting, when the um, when it was brought to my attention that they had been operating, the police, our enforcement mechanism, did go and visit the establishment and inform them of the uh, where they were in the permitting process. Um, since that time, I believe some folks may have called the police department, um, but we don't have. I didn't receive a. Um, report on that. And there was certainly no action, formal enforcement action taken at the establishment. Have counselors been able to look at the entertainment ordinance and the public nuisance ordinance? Um, are there any questions with regard to that? I have I'm a trying question. to wait till Kim gets here. Yes, Tom. So uh, just uh, just to clarify, we can put a we could if we wanted to put a restriction on outdoor music, and so that outdoor music could only play until 10 p.m. on weekdays and 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. Would that would not affect uh, any indoor music, which I understand from the email threads has not been raised as a concern as they've done indoor music for some time. Is that is that clear? Is that correct that we could have an outdoor restriction? That is correct. It's also, I want to um, clarify that this is specifically about um, outdoor live music. That's what falls under the entertainment permit portion. They still have a deck and could still serve outside other days of the week. That's already been approved through their liquor license permit. What's really in question here is the ability to have live shows. Um, so you could limit that to days or hours or both. Um, they could still use their deck. Um, but not for live music. But the the noise ordinance limits the the, the hours to 10 p.m. Is that correct, Jesse? That is correct. Yes, still within okay. those that ordinance. Yes. Right. So, so I have a question. Has have they ever had concerts on that deck before? Is this something totally brand new? So my understanding is that they built the deck. Sorry, this is before my time. So sometime in the last year, I think this winter into spring, got their liquor license to serve on the patio, which they have been doing, um, and then submitted, They there was some misunderstanding about needing an entertainment permit to hold live music events. So when they, so that request, that permit request is a new request um, issued in June. And I see Kim now on, the phone as well. Andrew, is you're that muted, Kim. We cannot hear you, Kim. We hear, we see your mouth and you're, we see you are trying to talk. There you I'm go. Sitting outside the, the door at City Hall or at your, where you told me to go. Um, Deb told me to go around the back of the police station and nobody's answering the door. Oh, if you, if you want to come in, um, you go to the door that's labeled Community Services Vet Center at the front parking lot. Oh, okay. Um, and I am upstairs on the second floor. Okay, all right. All right, the police station told me to come around back here, and so I guess yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> so, okay, I'll be right in there. Thank you. See you soon. Okay. Well, we wait. I just want to comment. We did receive, uh, and, uh, I'm sure everyone received it, right? The, uh, the email chain with the back and forth where they got permits 
four to build the stage from Delilah. They've got, you know, they got an okay from the SBPD and the SBFD. Um, so we weren't, we're, we're, we're certainly, the city wasn't surprised that uh, that, a, that, a, that a, this outdoor venue was put in place. No, um, I think the surprise is, is that they hadn't applied for the actual entertainment permit. So um, that was the surprise. Um, and I know that we all want to hear from Kim. Um, so we'll wait for her. It looks like she's getting to the right door. And I think that the, the concerns that were, I'll just go over the concerns that were highlighted by the residents who attended our last meeting was that it was seven days per week. Uh, it's listed from Sundays through Saturdays and that it could happen between 12 noon and 10 p.m. So that is a length of time. That's 10 hours per day, seven days per week, uh, that where there could potentially be concerts and, and um, unwelcome noise. That's the, the definition of noise uh, for, for people who live in the surrounding areas. Um, and I think that is a valid concern. Um, and I think that it does depend on, you know, the finding a reasonable time length as well as perhaps days um, that this would occur. We know that there are children living in that neighborhood who would be attending schools. Um, and so having uh, music Monday through Thursday up until 10 p.m. could be of concern. Um, now, this is for the summer. Of course, children aren't attending school, but yet there are young children who need their sleep. They're growing. Um, and so I think that we could think more about what time of day and what days would be appropriate. Um, and I do see that she's in the room now, Jesse. Is that right? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Kim. Nice Hi, Kim. You. you can you can look at yeah wherever yeah. you want. We yeah. we can hear you fine, and I know it's kind of odd. <laughs> Not weird. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been standing out front or out in the bag for quite a while. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you found me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yes. What what concerns did you have? Yes, the concerns from the residents, and they spoke to us. There were two residents that attended last uh, our last meeting, and they were very concerned uh, about the seven days per week and potentially ten hours per day. Oh, um, yeah. If that no, would be the only reason I put that on the license um, was just so I never did anything wrong. You know, if I had a wedding on a Sunday afternoon, I'd be covered. Basically, it's going to be Friday and Saturday night from uh, seven to ten, and and then a few events in between. But and we've only got a short period. You know, the summer months are short, so so that's. Would it also go into the warmer early fall months? It could. Yeah, it could. I mean, I'd like to keep it year round, just in case I, you know, I was thinking about having a nice bar and, and you know, just different things out in the patio if I can. So, so music with uh, entertainment. Uh, uh, with entertainment, yeah, like, you know, I was even hoping like on a Sunday afternoon, once in a while, having karaoke and, you know, just different stuff. And and suppose I, I did have one event before I was aware that you guys this didn't go through. Um and it went well. I mean, it was the neighbors, I had gone over and talked to quite a few of them, and they said they couldn't even hear anything, even though I'm sitting outside. So it was it was it went pretty well. And and one gentleman said, you know, he could vaguely hear something over there. He knew that something was going on, but um, but he also said that, you know, he went inside and he couldn't hear a thing, so. 
Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, no, I just wanted to point out, um, this is Matt Cota, hi, Kim, um, city okay. councilor. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out that, um, or I wanted to comment on your comment, which is you were trying to get as wide as latitude as possible under the entertainment permit. Um, yeah. We're interested in, uh, I think there is some interest in putting guardrails to understand, um, you know, further define when outdoor entertainment can occur. Yeah. But I will say, I happened to be on Friday night uh, sh grocery shopping around eight o'clock at Hannaford. Yes, yeah. I live a glamorous life. Yeah. Um, and and I drove by and I rolled down my windows and and listened to a little bit of Neil Diamond uh, yeah. playing uh, Sweet Caroline and uh, saw people in the apartments next door sitting on their patio listening for free not purchasing yeah. anything at your establishment. Yeah. And I really thought, well, this is exactly, you know, we sit here and we look at rooms and meals uh, decline because of COVID and local option tax. And this is a local business that is, that is really trying to get back into it. And we, and I appreciate that. We're, we're also interested in making sure that the neighbors that aren't listening on their patio um, have some, have some assurances that they'll be, they won't have music from noon to, 10 o'clock, seven days a week, 365 wow. days a year. That's yeah. not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but we're here to make sure that it doesn't, and that we narrowly define when it's most appropriate to have these beds. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I should have put more on there. I just kind of did my open actors on the, um, yeah. um, the first application that I put through, you know, um, I was pretty sure that it covered both areas. And just to make sure, I went into City Hall and and um, I think it was Deb just said, you know, just give us, just fill this out. And if it's, you know, if we need to uh, add the extra on the outside, then we will. And, and I have given her the money for it. So, yeah. Are you the owner, Kim, or are you the manager? I'm the owner. How long have you been the owner? Of the be four years, November 7th. How many years? Sorry, four. Four. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that it was under new ownership. Okay. Yeah. And any Tom or Tim, did you have any comments to make? And I think before we start thinking about those guardrails that Matt referred to, uh, this is perhaps an appropriate time for us to hear from members of the public who have come. Okay. Well, I, so I just had a quick comment, Megan, oh. if I if I could. Please. Hi, Kim. You can't see me because my camera's not working. I'm sorry. I'm Tim Barrett. I'm also a city councilor. Nice to meet you. Hi, Tim. Nice to meet you. Uh, I have, on previous occasions, been known to karaoke at Franio's. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll give it a try at your establishment in a future date um, if, if, the, if the songs are good, the song choice. <laughs> but um, and so so you, you do have some speakers out on the deck now? No. 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 Um, oh. I mean, I've, I've got speakers, but they're not permanently out there now. Oh, oh so yeah. Matt, when you heard the music, where was it coming from? On the stage or, or in the patio area? The, the, these are the band's speakers, Tim, oh. I would assume. This is yeah. not a permanent setup. This is just a, you know, the guitar squadra brings out their amp and sets right. it up. Stop. Oh, you heard, so Matt, you, you heard some Neil Diamond, but was it was it from... A band or a person, or is it from just a recording? No, it was it was people. It was people, but were they outside or inside? Outside. Oh, they were outside. Oh, okay, all right. And, and was it acoustic or electrified or? No, it was a band. It's a band. Yeah, no, okay. it, it was amplified. Okay, yeah. and you you have a roof over that structure, right? No. Oh, it's an open air deck. Yes. I I just haven't been by in a while, so I I couldn't remember. But okay. Yeah, so what, what I'm concerned about is, you know, I, I'm one of these people that likes my quiet <laughs> space wherever I am, you know, unless I'm someplace that's, that's supposed to be you know, noisy. And, and um, um, so I, I'm sensitive to, to neighbors' concerns, uh, but I also want your business to thrive. And it, so it's a waiting factor back and forth between, you know, who, who's affected uh, the most and, and how far and, and your sound travels and how loud it is that's those are the questions right so um so as what, i what, what, as ahead. i tim right um 
So I, I'm also very concerned about that because I would not want to disrupt anybody's life or anything else. So I took it upon myself to literally go to the only neighbors that I have and, and ask before and after, and they were just all excited. I mean, every single one of them that I spoke to was very excited and couldn't, um, couldn't wait until to sit outside and watch it if, if I did have something outside. And it was just, you know, and then afterwards, I took it upon myself to go over again and ask the number of people that I, I could, you know, what they thought, if it disrupted them, if, and they couldn't hear it. They, they could not hear. They're like, you could vaguely hear and you could tell something was going on, but you couldn't, there was, and, and if you went inside, you couldn't hear anything. Where did you go, Kim? Was it the apartment building across from the old post? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other side is is um, the animal shelter. And were you able to um, talk to people who um, have children, or do you know what kind of households you were talking to? Yeah, I don't know of anybody that has children in that building. They're basically a lot of um, single, just working class people. Um, but I, I'm unaware of any children in there. Thank you, Kim. And I'm very open to hear any, you know, anything. If there is children in there, I would love to hear you know, what they had, I, I'm, you know, obviously the ordinance is 10 o'clock, so right. we would stop playing anything by 10 o'clock. Tom, do you have any comments based on? So Kim, yeah, Kim, tell, tell me, would it be, ter um, it seems to me that the Sunday through Thursday with neighbors hearing this and the, what I have seen of the concerns that maybe 9 p.m. would be a more reasonable cutoff time and maybe a, an additional restriction that might say something since you said you're really looking at, you're looking at Friday and Saturday nights and then maybe an occasional other night. Yeah. If we put a, a restriction to, to ensure the neighbors will have a seven day, day straight, what if we had a limit where uh, no more than one day uh, or three days total in a week? Uh, would you be playing music outdoors? Are, are those parameters that you think you could operate within? Um, 9 p.m. stop by Sunday through Thursday, and then no more than three days a week, would you have outdoor music? Well, uh, night, during the week, stopping at 9? Is yeah, that what you're asking? Sunday. On Sunday through Thursday. 10 o'clock on Friday or Saturday? Oh, absolutely. I, you know what? To be honest with you, I, I honestly, my honest opinion, I'm not probably going to have any more than one and that's if it's not raining um like on a friday or saturday night mm -hmm. so yes that would be very reasonable i mean like i said if i if i have a friday and possibly a saturday night the only other thing i would do it would be like a special event or it would be a you know karaoke and karaoke in the afternoon on a sunday or something like that. But um, yeah, it's not going to be more than two or three times a week. As a quick follow up, I challenged Councillor Barrett to karaoke. I, I do a pretty mean Jimmy Buffett. So just let me know what happens. And as long as you've got Jimmy Buffett, I'm there. We're going to take you up on that. We stepped on a pop top. I knew it. <laughs> I have another question for Kim. Kim, which which side of the building is the new deck? Is it on the east side facing that residential uh, apartment building? It's on the opposite side. It's on the animal shelter. Oh, it's on the animal shelter side. Oh, well, okay. It's right. It's right in that little crevice in between the new Hannaford's building and um, and the old what what used to be the old Franios, but you know, right there. It's kind of it's kind of stuck right in there in that little that small small little space in the back. So it's on the south side or it's on the west side. It's okay. it's face it's south. So if you're a if you're a Hannaford, well I was a Hannaford's and you know that yeah. bank that gets you up to the new Hannaford's, which used to be yeah. the old Kmart. Yeah. And you're and you're looking down, you're looking down right into the. Oh, uh, okay. The From the retaining. In fact, yeah. So if you there's it could be a bunch of people that could. Um, 
you could see it for, you could see it visibly from there it's not yeah. there's not walls around it or, or yeah or, yeah right or, right 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 yeah. i just uh yeah the google views is not it, it's too the picture's too old so i understand so i'm just trying to understand the, the acoustic dynamics of what would go on there and there is a retaining wall that gets up to about eight feet high at the at the highest point right where queen city park road comes into the t i think yeah. but um That's other right. than that i mean the road you can used to be able to turn onto it from there. So, um, so, so it's actually, there is a partial protection to the apartment building and it's, it looks to me like acoustically, it probably, it doesn't reach the Humane Society because it's blocked by the Hannaford building, right? And, and yeah. your own building probably buffers the noise, excuse me, the music from penetrating towards um, the other neighborhood that's across uh, Queen City Park Road, uh, but but yeah, I let's let the neighbors talk or whoever's here. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say that I believe this what's on the screen now is for the next agenda item. So hopefully, yeah, okay. Sorry. I just I wanted people to watching to know that that this it had nothing to do with the yeah. old post. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and just a. Uh, one question for clarification, Jesse. So this would be a one-year permit. Correct. Well, I would hope that it would be a yearly permit, you know, after that, but, but, but just for this year, yes. Yeah, this one is just for this year, yeah. and you'd have to come back in every year. Yeah. Same with liquor licenses. Yeah. Okay. And so if we were to approve it in July, it would be good through next July? Or was there a start date of July 1st? Or is there another start date for permits? So traditionally they're done by, I believe they're done here by fiscal year. So it would be through this June. And then with the liquor license renewal next spring, likely Kim would reapply at that point. All right, thank you for that clarification. And I would also like to open this up to residents who have come here to speak. And just turn on your camera and I will recognize you and then you can speak. Okay, Lauren Smith, I think you were, Lori, you were going to speak. Ah, no, it is Laura Waters. Very good. Hey, hi. Yeah, sorry, I was not very good at the camera. Hi. Well, um, yeah, I just, so I have um, a couple questions that, that don't relate to the music or the noise, but I'm just curious about the parking. Um, I know somebody had seen um, something on Facebook about um, announcing that there would be parking up in the Hannaford, the overflow parking. And so I'm curious about how that's managed. Is there an agreement with Hannaford? Um, if there's overflow parking, is there any way to keep cars from just parking up that little road where you know the bikes go or behind the apartments that are right there across from the building? Um, has there been any uh, any uh, assessment or evaluation of of what's going to happen when you're attracting so many additional people to that site? Because I know it's a super popular place, and even without the outdoor music venue, that that parking lot gets really full. So I assume that it's gonna get pushed out a lot. Um, so that's that's one question. And then does the city ever um, implement sanctions if somebody goes past the 10 o'clock uh, uh, limit as far as, as music and noise and things like that that are in the, the regulations? So those are my two comments, questions. So um, Lori, is, sorry, is that your name, Laura? Laura? <laughs> um, so there are enforcement provisions in the ordinance that come with fines. That is the, and they're escalating fines based on offenses. And those are issued by the PD. So that's the enforcement answer to your question. And then I will turn it over to Kim to talk about parking. Yeah, well, I, Hannaford's parking lot, as anybody would know that lives around there was closed for a long time. Um, it was, fenced off and yep there you know as many people that can park in the parking lot and come in there i do not have an agreement with anybody as far as anything else as far as where people park or what they say on social media i have no control over is that good 
anybody else would like to speak? Uh, I see Almy Landauer. Yes. And we can't hear you, Almy. Not the camera, but not the mic. Thank you. Right. Now um, we hear you. Okay, great. So, Kim, I appreciate you coming to the meeting tonight. Um, I feel somewhat reassured by your the information that you've uh, shared with us, but um, I still have some questions and concerns. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, my feeling is that uh, that the the guardrails, so to speak, should be in the permit, um, and not just relying on you know somebody saying what they're going to do, because um, I have concerns about uh, you know what happens if it's a new owner does the permit carry over um, uh, the uh, from my understanding there's no decibel limits in the South Burlington ordinances so what if um, you know the owner gets new speakers or the band brings in their own sound system with big amps um, you know how do we know that in the future um, the decibel levels aren't going to go you know way up compared to what they are now and him you know letting us know that she's talked to some close by neighbors and they haven't been disturbed by the, con the concerts that, that have been held <laughs> in the last month, including last Friday, even though there was no permit yet. Um, so those are some of my continuing concerns uh, that I think should be addressed in the permit by the city. Um, and then uh, I also, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a policy wonk, but I did see the 10 p.m. Um, in the noise ordinance, but I also saw 12 p.m. somewhere else in, uh, and I, I didn't write it down, but it was in somewhere in, uh, it was maybe the entertainment permit section of the ordinances or someplace else. So I was a little unclear um, as to whether the city limited uh, outdoor noise to 10 p.m. or to 12 midnight, and I'd like that clarified if possible. Thank you. Okay, Jesse. Yes. Um, so, um, Ami, thanks for coming back. So the guardrails, I think the discussion the council is having now is whether they would put guardrails into the permit. So if they were to approve the permit, they could put guardrails or conditions in that permit. Um, it does not transfer with the owner. A new owner of the facility would need to get their own permitting. Um, you are correct that there, there are no decibel limits in the ordinance currently. Um, and I believe where you, I would, I would want to double check where you saw the midnight. I believe what that is referencing is if there is a city sponsored event that the city puts on and approves for itself, we have some flexibility like if we do a fireworks show or something like that to go past 10 PM, but that's not as that's not part of the, um, pub, uh, private business entertainment license. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Helpful. Thank you, Jesse. And Tom. So since we have a new city manager, and I also find repetition works, the comment I've made previously over the last six or seven years is something that I I would certainly still support. And as we um, as we deal with a variety of sound related issues, my uncle Leo Nato, a South Burlington resident, used to be the chief of police in Essex, and he had on his police force trained decibel readers. And when the fairgrounds would have a concert, the, their police officers would take out their decibel readers and get measures so that they could capture true data uh, so that they could regulate that to some extent with the bands that would go through. So I, I would encourage us as uh, we build up our capacity and skill set within the police, I, I would encourage the, the South Burlington Police Department to be capable of capturing decibel readings. I think that could be a separate discussion from this, uh, but it's something that I, I think is feasible that I'd like to hear more about our ability to do so. Yes, Matt. I have a question for the chair or for Jesse. Do we have to convene as a liquor control board? Or how does that work? No, you actually don't. The entertainment um, permits are solely within city ordinance. And um, they're actually within under the city manager purview. But past practice in South Burlington has been to bring them to the council. So we were erring on the side of council approval through ordinance. Andrew, Perfect. I said something wrong there. Okay. Great. I just want to make sure we're doing it right. Thanks. Sharon. I see Sharon O'Neill. 
Hi, um, thanks. And thanks, Kim, for coming to the meeting tonight and answering questions. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go over my concerns that I listed last time. Um, but I do have a question. If you do put some parameters in place, um, is there, once the permit is issued with or without parameters, is there any ability for the public, the neighborhood around to revisit this if what's in place isn't working for the neighborhood? I sure, and um, so I believe, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong here, that um, the ordinance does allow for a revocation of a permit um, if if that became a concern in the future. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't um, suggesting or thinking revoking, but just putting additional what were you calling them guardrails or stipulations like that because i you know i certainly want this um you know i want kim's business to thrive as well and i i see that they're doing creative things um to build the business and i intentionally moved to this part of burlington because it's probably the quietest part of burlington um and so i'm just saying if you do put some guidelines in and it's um the noise is disruptive, I'm not thinking revoking, I'm thinking adding additional stipulations or guidelines. Andrew, would you like to answer? I do see that there are approval conditions in the entertainment ordinance, but maybe Andrew wants to. Sure, yeah, you can You can certainly revoke. There is a for cause standard in it. Um, we can also put, pursue injunctive relief just on the enforcement side. Um, but as far as re reissuing, um, I think that would that would have to come under the application. I think that would again either come before Jesse or uh, council. I think that could be stipulated in whatever uh, decision the council has as far as what the conditions are. Um, it can be a conditional approval in some some manner um, that requires some type of check-in. I don't think that that's outside of council's purview here. Thank you. Any other members of the public who wish to speak? Okay. All right, if you choose to speak, I think we're still gonna be discussing for some time. I, I would like to just read the approval conditions. Um, they're not all of them, they don't all apply, uh, but we've already discussed one, establishing specific hours for the proposed show. The second one, and this is, has to do with what Tom Chittenden spoke to with regard to decibel readings, establishing noise limits. And I don't know if there's any way to establish noise limits other than having a decibel reader. Is there any other way to establish noise limits? I mean, to enforce them. We could establish them and then we need to be able to enforce them, right? Right, the way I've seen that, Andrew, do you wanna? Uh, yeah, I would just say we traditionally we've done it based on you know the decibel levels. Um, I will say that there is some language already that I think council's seen it before, uh, performance standards in our land development regulations that certainly could be referenced as a standard if if necessary. That's an average as opposed to a peak decibel level. Am I, is that right? Is my memory correct? Yes. Um, requiring the provision of traffic control personnel at no cost to the city, requiring the provision of crowd control and medical personnel at no cost to the city, it goes on to firefighting, um, talks about trash and litter, uh, restricting or prohibiting the consumption of alcoholic beverages in connection with any regula regulated activity, uh, and then the sale or, of admission or seating tickets. Um, I think what we've heard from the neighbors here is the hours and the noise limits and the traffic. Um, and I, I I don't know the appetite of the council to impose conditions. I think some ways it can put everybody at ease when there are conditions. Um, and it would um, give people a, a just a, an assurance that 
Kim, you're you're a fair player, and and we will all <laughs> move forward and and know what the what the you know we've been using the word guardrails, but what the parameters are, and as long as um, we all enter into that freely, um, that we can have confidence going forward that that will be respected. Um, since this is a new thing uh, for this neighborhood, uh, I, I would be in favor of, of putting those conditions on simply to allay those, those concerns and, and then let people go forward with confidence. Kim, you sound like a very responsible business owner. You sound like you're sensitive to, to the people. You did you know, the extra act of going ahead of time and notifying and then afterwards in order to, to make sure that what happened was uh, within the norms that the people living close to you could live with. Um, and I, I find that to be laudable. Um, and that also raises the confidence level. And we heard that from, uh, uh, sorry, just a minute, my computer. No, I don't want to do that. Stop. My computer is telling me things that I don't want to do. Um, so what I um, would suggest is that we talk about the, did you say, Counselor Chittenden, Tom, uh, Sunday to Thursday till, I don't know if you want to do from 12 till 9. That's still a lot of time. Um, we could think about a small, we could think about the the number of hours up until nine, perhaps, um, and then Friday and Saturday, uh, perhaps again the number of hours up until ten, and then Sunday, you know, the number of hours. Does that go ahead, Tom? I, I believe it, it. I was sensing out Kim's uh, Emma, uh, receptiveness to also limiting to no more than three outdoor music events in every any seven day week period. So it, she seemed amenable to that, and that seemed to conform to her her plans. And I, I think that would give neighbors a lot of uh, peace of mind, knowing that there won't be a band coming and playing for five nights in a row or seven nights in a row. Very good. And, and can I see? And, and I'm always there. So if anybody at any time, any of the neighbors that have joined or, or anybody else ever has any questions, any, you can always either come and see me personally or call me and, and just talk, you know, talk to me and let me know your concerns. I am always there. So, and I, I'm not sure if you know, you were at your house on Friday night, but I'd love to hear if you heard any noise as well. Feel free That's to turn on your cameras if you wish to respond to her question. Anybody who's here? Almi? We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, I was not aware there was a concert Friday night and I was uh, watching a movie with headphones, so I didn't hear anything, but <laughs> I don't know if I would have. Um, I'm probably of the of the of the residents that are that are at this meeting, I'm probably the farthest away too. So it wasn't this past Friday because I, I was told um, by Deb, I believe, from from City Hall that uh, the permit didn't go through yet. So I, I did one where I thought it was okay. And then the this past Friday, I told the band they couldn't be outside, which I, I did lose a lot of revenue from it, but um, but they they played inside, but it was the, the previous Friday, not this past Friday. So oh, I apologize. Sorry about yeah, that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And again, I really appreciate whenever a business owner uh, approaches, uh, you know, a, a new situation of uncertainty with that, with, you know, with that openness, I, I think it just it bodes well for the future. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, so, Councillor Chitney, you talked about three nights per week. Is that correct? Three events per week, three events per week. Um, so that could include Friday and Saturday, and then allow for a third event if there is something on Sunday or something during the week. Okay. Tim and Matt, 
How does that sound? Um, <clears throat> I mean that that's okay. I I I'm more open to like having fewer restrictions. Actually, I mean it sounds like Kim doesn't have a, a band plan for every night of the week. Um, and the ten o'clock stopping time is that's that's a good that's a good stopping time, and that's that goes with our ordinance. Um, I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of opposition from neighbors about about noise at this point. Um, I mean, maybe what we should do is not have any restrictions and then, you know, revisit this in a month or, you know, two months and see if, if neighbors have have issues with it. I, I saw Matt's hand and then Almi, I will recognize you. Matt? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Tim and not Tom on this one, which is, uh, you know, the issue with restrictions is, say, uh, a, a, a business down the street then decides to hold something. It's like we're, we're creating policy. We're creating precedent. Um, I think I think the owner, Kim, and the owners of the old post, they're under they're under pressure now. They understand that if this is going to be a successful venture, that they need to work with their neighbors. And I, and, and every year this is going to come up. And if they don't, and if they don't work with their neighbors, this is not going to be a continuing business venture. Um, so um, they're not going to be able to have live music outside. So I'm, I'm in favor of fewer restrictions. We have the 10 o'clock stop time. They violate that. They get a fine. They violate it again. They get another higher fine. And if this continues to be a problem, we can revisit it. And then if a year goes by and there's and there's numerous problems, then we can revoke it. We cannot we cannot let out how them have it again. So um, I'm in favor of of of, of passing this entertainment license um, now that we've had this conversation, but not imposing any significant restrictions. Almi Landauer. And we can't hear you. I would be very disappointed if you did not um, narrow down those days and hours. I think that you cut out again, Almi. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Almi, can you hear me? Because we cannot hear you. It sounds like she doesn't have audio or or the speaker. Okay, Barb, I'm gonna write to Almi. If you could- uh, I wouldn't do that. Um, oh. So oh. For, for it to be something that is, uh, is uh, you know, has a, um, an intermediary of a city permit, I think is important. We missed about a minute of what you had to say, Almi. <laughs> oh, your, can your you sound cut stop. out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? I don't want to repeat myself. Well, we heard just the very beginning and then just the very end about the permit. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll try to I'll try to be briefer. Um, I, I would I would be disappointed if the, if there were no conditions in the permit uh, because I think that what Megan said about um, some reassurance and some backing from the city that that the that the neighbors' concerns are are important um, is critical at least for me um, and uh, I personally would not feel comfortable walking into a bar and asking to speak with the owner if I had concerns about the noise levels. Um, I I think having an inter intermediary um, uh, that has the power to enforce things is important. Thank you. Loud and clear. Thank you, Barb. Actually, Megan, I'm not sure that I need to say anything. Ami said it very well, but I would I would support the concept of compromise. And if if this is a successful year, then the business owner can come back next year and maybe ask to extend it a little bit. But at least uh, I think it is a nice. I listened to what the homeowner said at the last meeting, and I think they raised some significant issues. And I hope that the council will find a nice sort of middle ground in terms of this initial permit because it does support a business that we want to be successful but we also have homeowners that we want to have some peace thank you barb anybody else would like to speak up 
I, I, I go back to what I said. I think that it does um, instill this relationship with confidence. Um, if we do simply put in some conditions that are reasonable, um, are, are allowing Kim to have a thriving business and, and to just put the neighbors at ease because I think it will just get that relationship off on a really good foot. Um, having seen relationships sour simply because of lack of trust, um, I think is uh, setting, setting the old post up for, for, for failure. And I, I don't want to do that. And I think that um, it, it just, it creates clarity and, and, um, I do want to just say I, I saw on Facebook that there was a, a bridal shower at the old post. It looked wonderful. So I know that this is not just going to be out and out, you know, um, unleashing the, you know, the, the nightmare that people could imagine on, on the neighborhood. But I, I simply think that what Tom, Tom Chittenden had to say is reasonable. Um, Kim seemed to uh, agree that it was reasonable to have um, three events per week and to have the Sunday through Thursday cutoff time be nine o'clock and the Friday and Saturday cutoff time be 10 p.m. Um, I like that. I think it's it's a nice condition um, that everybody can rely on. Yes, Matt. Megan, I, and I and I I think you you you've stated it very well. And uh, I would support that, as you just described. Can we can we ask Kim if if she thinks that that's a fair request for, of her of business? Of course, of course. Go ahead. Now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So Matt and Tom, thank you very much for for doing that. I honestly don't see me doing even three. So I appreciate that. I would like to have the neighbors feel as comfortable as possible. So that to me is is extremely reasonable. And I'm even willing to give my cell phone number for all me or any of them so that they can call me and not have to walk over. That's great. So if, if they have a paper and a pen, I would love to give them my number. So it's 802-363. Four five four zero. Hello. Hello. Yes, is that Michael? Oh, did you? I just wanted to bring you up to date on this uh, matter because I know of your concern about it. We got uh, Friday night. Got a message from uh, Khrushchev, which uh, said that uh, he would uh, withdraw these missiles and technicians and so on, providing we <laughs> did not plan to invade Cuba. We uh, then got a message, uh, a public one, the next morning in which he said he would do that if we was we got a text war here. from Turkey. Jesse, can we, we, then we, we got to no, I think, I think we need to yeah. 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 mute that one. Into that deal. Yeah, just kick so, him out. Uh, Sorry about that, folks. Okay, yes. That's, that's just part of <laughs> that was a geopolitics big discussion in the middle of a uh, bar burn. <laughs> 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 At least it wasn't Warcraft like it was last time at the school board meeting. <laughs> so, so Jesse, I, uh, I make it. A, are we at a point of making a motion, or, or where, where are we? I, at? I think we've. There's just the question of parking that the other, another resident, Laura Waters, raised. Um, is that something? I'm not worried about parking. Okay. Can we? Sorry, say that again, Kim. I'm not worried about parking at all. That was never raised as an issue. Yeah. And and I think that even if that became an issue, that could still be dealt with after we we approve an entertainment permit. Sure. Is that correct, Jesse? Yes. Okay. All right. So I think we have arrived then at a at maybe the time for a motion. And so, FDR uh, I would make, has arrived. Just to yeah. get ready for another deletion, because there's a person called FDR, and I don't think they're yeah. probably oh, they're gone. Okay, Got it. Sorry. Okay. You're going to have to be vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. Go ahead. I would make a motion 
if you wrote down what Megan just articulated, uh, three days a week, Sunday through Thursday, shut off time, 9 p.m., Friday and Saturday, um, shut off time, 10 p.m., I believe that that encapsulated what you said, Megan. That would be my motion. Second. Is there a second? Is there is a second. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Tom, um, I think seconded. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I saw Tom's thumbs up. So I believe that's unanimous. So that would be through June 30th of 2022, Kim. And we do wish you a very successful year, almost year. And and we also look forward to seeing you back and and hope that everything goes well. Thank you for your time. Best wishes, Kim. Thank you, Kim. All right. Have a good night. You That's too. You too. All right. Very good. Our next agenda item. Now, I believe uh, we have a let me just move back to the agenda we have a presentation um this is item number 10 council consideration and possible approval of a letter of support to the vermont housing and conservation board for the affordable housing financing application submitted by summit properties for their development at hillside at o'brien farm and jesse our city yeah. manager will be leading us in this discussion Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll do a little table setting. Andrew, if you can help, if any of those folks come back, keep an eye out, that would be helpful to me. Um, so just by way of table setting, um, we have um, Zeke from Summit here, as well as Tom Getz from Summit here. Um, and I think that's all, they are the developers. Um, this is a uh, perpetually affordable project as part of O'Brien Farms. Um, they are looking for low-income tax credits from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, and those are very competitive tax credits, and therefore a letter of support from myself and the council is uh, helpful during that process. So that is what we are asking for tonight, is your approval to co-sign with me that letter of support. Um, Tom can walk you through the project if you are interested. I will note, and I have been learning so much, um, that on May 25th, um, the Affordable Housing Committee actually passed two motions supporting um, this specific development at O'Brien Farm. So they are in support of this effort as well. Um, so I, and I will leave it there and defer to the council if, if you would like a summary from uh, Tom Getz on this project. Yes, I, I would like to know more about it because I think we all, at least I should say I, am interested in seeing more affordable housing in the city. It's one of our, our goals as a city. And tell us more about what you do and how you do it. All right. Thank you for having me tonight. And sorry for almost hijacking the meeting by sharing my screen earlier. I'm not sure how that happened, but I wasn't trying to jump my turn in line. Um, so no yeah, I'm, uh, Tom Gatson, the CEO of Summit Properties, and we're based right here in South Burlington. Um, over our offices are at the Pines Senior Living Community. Um, we are developers of affordable and mixed income housing in Vermont, New Hampshire, and upstate New York. Uh, we currently manage about 1,400 apartments uh, in those three states, almost uh, all mixed income or affordable. Um, and a good portion of that is senior housing like the Pines here in South Burlington. Um, and in recent years, our, our focus has been more on the mixed income, uh, non-age restricted family properties. And that is what we are proposing here in South Burlington. Um, our most recent, we have two recent properties that are going to be very similar to this. And they're actually both in Winooski, our, our last two that Jesse knows very well, um, right? If you've driven into Winooski recently on East Island Street. Um, 39 unit Casavant Overlook is on the left side. That opened up last year and we're finishing up on the north side of East Island uh, Park Terrace Apartments, which is 45 units of mixed income housing, which will be opening in September. Um, so this project um, in collaboration with the uh, O'Brien, uh, Hillside at O'Brien Farm community, we have two uh, two buildings on lots 10 and 11, and I can 
share my screen. I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with the Hillside, at least the city council, the Hillside at O'Brien Farm community. Um, but okay, thank you, Jesse. Let's see. So this is the hillside site plan. And here at the bottom where my lots 10 and 11, it's probably a little tough for you to see on the screen, but it's these two buildings here, um, which are the, gonna be the next phases of, of hillside. And it's gonna be two 47 unit kind of sister buildings, four stories, um, underground parking, and um, they are both going to be basically identical uh, unit mixes. It's going to be mixed income. So there will be, um, in the total community, there's going to be 79 affordable apartments and 15 market rate. Uh, and the affordable apartments will break down. There will be a mix of 60%, uh, so units targeted at uh, folks earning less than 60% of area median income. And then 33 of the affordable apartments will be affordable to very low income uh, folks earning less than 30% of area median income. And through a partnership with COTS, um, who we've worked with on our last two Winooski projects, 18 of the very low income apartments will have supportive services for the homeless and at risk. Um, and this is a model that we've used uh, at our last two, two buildings where we get referrals for COTS, they help us identify residents. It's folks that they think are ready to make the transition from um, you know, homelessness or at risk into uh, permanent housing. So there's there's no transitional housing here. It's all, um, you know, the intent is to find permanent solutions for those folks that are getting the supportive services on site. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the uh, apartments. It's perpetual affordability. So as Jesse mentioned, um, you know, this is gonna be partially financed by low-income housing tax credits. Um, that's through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. The actual immediate application here would the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is for their ARPA funding. So it's something that City Council you were talking about tonight. Another component of the ARPA funding is to support projects that include um, mixed income and, and specifically the homeless targeting piece. So that is the application that's being submitted this week is, is the ARPA piece, but the, the tax credit portion is another critical component of the, the sort of the financing stack that, that makes these projects work. So this letter of support this immediate one will go to the Vermont Housing Conservation Board if the City Council um, feels it's a, a project you all want to support, um, but, but would also be relevant for the, the future tax credit application. Um, um, that's the, the, the big picture. I don't, and, and once so I, I do, I don't have um, renderings to show you. We're still in, close on the design phase, so I, I don't have the architecturals. Um, but what I can just quickly, and I, I guess it's important to note that. The support we're asking for tonight has nothing to do with, with the permitting. We still have to go through final plat, which we're working on now. We're going to be submitting this week. All the design elements, um, the to to totally separate process. So we'll, we will be going through that final plat and hoping to get our permits um, application final submitted within the next month. And um, timeline wise, um, with that uh, in place, we would be hoping to break ground on this by April uh, of, of next year and then a 12 to 14 month construction period opening in the you know around june of 2023 would be the target so thank you could you describe or explain the tax credits and how that works as an incentive to to build mixed affordability housing sure yeah so um almost all uh new construction affordable housing in vermont and and nationwide really at least some component is the low income housing tax credit program so there's two ways that that program works there's there's uh it, it's essentially it's a, a grant program if you want to in putting it in the most simple terms where we apply for the tax credits which are then awarded to the project which we then find investors who need tax credits and will pay us cash, which we use as equity for the project in exchange for getting the federal tax credits to offset their tax liability. So there's two ways that those are doled out in, in each state. One portion of them are, is a competitive allocation process. Um, and that's for the, they call them the 9% tax credits, just in simple terms, the, the, the most valuable um, tax credits. And then there's 
the portion that we're present or proposing on this project, which is 4% tax credits, exact same deal. They're allocated by the state. Um, we sell them to an investor who, who gives us equity to build the project. Those tax credits are actually currently undersubscribed in the state. So they're, at that part is not a competitive pro process. Those are essentially automatically awarded to the project. Um, but it's a much, much smaller component of your, the equity you would need to develop the project. That's why to fill the gaps, things like this ARPA funding are, are, are critical. Um, if you can get one of those very, very valuable 9% tax credit awards, highly, highly competitive process, you've um, essentially gotten around 70% of the resources you need to make it happen. And, and so those, you know, when you get those awards, it's, it's uh, you know, much simpler. Um, it, if you're not getting those awards, more resources are necessary like this ARPA funding. Are, are there other questions before I, I dive into all my questions? I simply have that follow up to his presentation. Yes, Megan, this is Tim. Just a quick one. Um, can you just orient us quickly because the map is kind of small on my computer? Is that Kennedy Drive at the northern top of the? That is Kennedy Drive, yes. Okay. And, and can... is that the curb cut that is, it's not really there now, but it's visible as you're driving down Kennedy Drive? That That's correct. Yep. That is the, 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 the to be constructed curb cut on Kennedy Drive. Okay, and and could you just circle around where the building is, or is it is it two buildings at this point? Your two applying? buildings right here, lots ten and eleven. Okay, those two buildings. Okay, thank and you. And I can just drag over if you can see see that one. Now here's a little more of a close up. Right, right. This is the intersection. It's these two yep. buildings right here, lots ten and eleven. So I'll, I'll bet Megan's going to ask some questions about the efficiency of the buildings and the. Uh, especially the energy. Go ahead, Tim, go ahead. <laughs> so in lieu of the fact that we just passed a, a climate action resolution tonight, do you have anything to say about these buildings in terms of, of how uh, how they'll prefer, perform from a CO2 perspective at all? Uh, I don't have any of the, the data on the CO2 perspective. All of the, um, you know, the heating will all be electric with uh, mini splits. So that, that's the same um, model that we've used at our last building at, at Park Terrace. So there'll be every unit will be electric heat with, with the energy efficient mini split units. Okay. Um, you know, all Energy Star rated appliances. Um, so in, in terms of, um, you know, utilization of fossil fuels, it's, it's well minimized. Um, but I don't have the, the data for you on the CO2, um, which is, one that I can de can definitely get. Um, you know, in terms of the energy efficiency, that is part of the review process. Um, you know, there's an energy efficiency checklist that is submitted um, with our application for um, housing credits. Um, so that that is, but it, it, that wasn't one of the questions in terms of the actual emissions calculations. So that's not. Is there any about. solar that's planned in bulk for the hillside besides individual? I know that they made arrangements for for individual homes to have solar. But what about these large uh, collective buildings? Is there any plan for that? So that I'm not sure if Evan Langfeld is on, and that is one thing that should I should make clear. Uh, Evan at, at O'Brien, um, we have, these two buildings are are we have under option agreement, and and these would be our you know the ones we're constructing. The Greater Hillside at O'Brien Farm that that's still um, under their purview, and if Evan is on, he could yep. he could speak to that. But if not, I'm I not am, sure what that is. I am on okay. Tom. And hi, everybody. Yeah, so our, <clears throat> on the hillside residential neighborhood, we are facilitating solar and encouraging it, uh, but we're not mandating it. And same thing on the the, the larger multifamily buildings, we're still assessing uh, whether it's viable to have rooftop mounted solar arrays. Uh, the you know the the challenge on this site is that it is a pretty dense site, so there's not really a, a good ground uh, array location for it, but uh, we, we're definitely looking at whether it's viable on a rooftop mount. Well, we certainly encourage it. That is something, and we do see, I don't know, I'm assuming that the roof will be south facing, southward facing, just thinking where that beam, that center beam is going to be. Um, that that it is. These will be flat roofs. Yeah. It is a flat roof. Okay. Yeah, they're all flat roof buildings. Yeah. Yeah. So if they're, if they're flat roof, there there really is no impediment to putting some type of solar on on top. 
at no, all. There's, there, there are other mechanical systems that go on, on the rooftop. So, I mean, you, oh, yeah. the split yeah. systems, you mean? That's where your splits go. That's where your compressors oh. go. Right. I understand. Right. I understand. And they can't have anything above them. Yeah. 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 It, you know, hey, listen, I mean, what, what I would say to you is if, if we can fit full solar up there, uh, you know, we're, we're all for it on, on the buildings that we're going to be doing. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, the summit guys are probably have a, a similar perspective if, if they can they can make it work i would think that you know, we, we're which all we do it. yeah and it's definitely something we'll revisit we tried to on the and we got um you know with the flat roofs and the amount of roofs top space that was left after the condenser units for the mini splits it was so minimal and, and not efficient on, on the buildings that we just completed that we ended up deciding not to but it is de definitely something we'll be willing to revisit because we do have it on some of our pitched roof buildings um we do have solar units and where it's great so mm -hmm. Particularly for rental units, it's not something that a new owner would have to, you know, I know that there's an issue with getting a home equity loan when there is solar, I, that this would not be the case when you have rental units. So it, it yeah. could be, yeah, something that would, I think, be quite attractive and, and more than attractive. It would be responsible. <laughs> it would be. Yeah, we, yeah, in our port, port, Vermont portfolio, we have quite a bit of solar that offsets um, most of the electric usage for our our about 300 of our Vermont apartments. Um, and, and some places where we couldn't make it work, whether there was a shaded rooftops, we, we ended up building a solar array to help offset that usage offsite. Um, so it, it's really looking at whether the, given the space and the efficiency of the rooftop units, if they make sense to do it on site, I love it. Yeah, it's, similarly with our properties across the street, uh, the country park, senior housing property, we just became an off taker of a solar project as well. Excellent. Other questions? Tim, did you have more? No, that's that's all I had. Thanks. Matt, yes. I would I would just add as you know, as the my former life on the development review board, uh, we reviewed this project at preliminary plat and I can't tell you how happy it makes me to see it because uh, one of the discussions that we had was we want to make sure that the affordable housing um, projects weren't last in line, um, that the market rates weren't first and affordable housing last and, and hearing that there is a possibility that we could break ground in April 2022 uh, uh, makes me very happy. Um, um, so anyways. And Tom, do you have any questions? I do not. I had a question about the number of bedrooms too. Is one to two bedrooms with the majority, it's almost twice as many, um, more than twice as many one bedroom apartments. Is that a, a market uh, study that led to that? Because uh, one to two bedroom apartments is, I would see that for you know a certain segment of our society, but not necessarily for families. Yeah, no, that's that that is a good question. It is based on our market um, market studies and recent market experience. We actually went through um, a, two or three years ago in the Vermont uh, qualified allocation plan, which is how they give out tax credits. There was a big emphasis on two bedrooms and larger over one bedrooms, and so our Casavant property in Winooski, we ended up going with 22 two bedrooms and 19 ones. We went with the majority two, um, and what we found was that despite thinking that the, that's where the demand would be, it just wasn't. Lease up was difficult um, and the demand for the one bedrooms was uh, incredible. So at our next project, Park Terrace in Winooski, which was 45 units, we kind of did a, a more even mix, slightly targeted more towards the uh, studios and ones. So about two thirds of the units there were the studios and ones and about a third, two bedrooms. Um, so that is more the mix we went with here and we're in the middle of that lease up process right now and we're finding that is repeating itself with the the, the demand for studios and one bedrooms for family housing um it, it may seem counterintuitive and it, it was for me when we when we first did park terrace um i was expecting the 22 or the the two bedroom units to be highly demand but there's still a very large demand for those one bedrooms um and studios so that that's how we came up with that use, unit mix for this one do you know the profile of the, is it a student, is it a young professional or a retired or? 
Um, there, there's a wide mix in our recent communities. Um, there are some, not, not as many retired folks, mostly, um, you know, younger working class middle, you know, folks that, you know, make $30,000 a year, um, you know, for a family. And, and it, there's also, there's such a wide mix of unit um, targeting for rents in terms of the profile between the folks in the units that are supportive services for the homeless versus those restricted to less than 30% area median income, those restricted less than 60% area median income, and then market rate. So you've got a, it, there's no um, sort of one size fits all or, or um, it, it's, it's a pretty wide range of both income levels and uh, tenant um, life experiences. What is on the south side of those buildings? What will be there? Uh, well, the, uh, the, the uh, parking lot areas or where you are on, on past I our see the road i see two brothers drive and then south of two brothers drive is that i'm just curious what so, would be what they'd be so, looking out at <laughs> so what, what what you have out to the to the upper left of the uh the drawing is it's a stormwater uh management area but it's uh, you could actually go out there now and see what we've done with it. So it's it has a, a path network, and we're going to be putting uh, picnic tables and pavilions out there. It's landscape. It's actually a really nice area. You see residents of the existing hillside neighborhood walking their dogs, and you see kids out there. So it's it, it's actually you know it's while it is a an active stormwater management area, it's actually turned into a little bit of a park space as well, which was what it was intended for. And is that your land south of Two Brothers Drive there? Is that it is, something? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And what will be on there? I see proposed lot 15 or 16. 7.3 acres. So I'm sorry, I guess I need to zoom in here because I can't the see. The bottom anymore. right hand side. Oh, the bottom right hand side. All right, hold on. Yep, your hand is on it. <laughs> so to the to the bottom right hand side, you actually have a pocket park. So there's a, a park there that's going to have a, a natural playground. Uh, so we're working with Wagner Hodgson, our, our landscape architects, to design a, a playground there that incorporates. There's a, there's a treehouse concept we're working on uh, with a natural slide uh, uh, feature, and then you know a variety of you know logs that are stacked in kind of creative ways. Uh, there's a tree concept that we're working on that has kind of built-in features to it. So immediately adjacent to the properties that we're talking about with Summit there is a park which is nice and then to the immediate uh south and so that that's actually to the north and east on the bottom right so to the to the southwest which would be the upper left hand side you have another park which is that stormwater management area the southwest is the upper left hand of that picture the southwest is the upper left hand of that picture yeah Oh, it got turned around. Okay. Where is Kennedy Drive again? Kennedy Drive would be at the top of the page. Okay, so wouldn't that be the northwest then? The upper left-hand side? So the north would be to your right. And it's kind west of an angle, would be... right? Like north is kind of like this way. It's sort of... Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. We've had that confusion. Call which side? Which side to call it? Whether to call this the north side or to call this the north side. But like that's, that's north right there, I think. Well, I'm confirming that confusion, I guess. Okay. <laughs> but, so, so, so to to uh, adjacent to lot 11 would be that pocket park with that natural playground features, and then to the left of lot 10, uh, you know, up against Kennedy is where that stormwater management area that has the path network. Where's lot 11 again? Can you put your hand on it? Okay, so I did understand. Okay. Okay. Very good. And, I guess and we need Summit, a compass rose on the strong. <laughs> and, and Summit is a for profit or a, a non profit? We are a uh, mission driven for profit developer. Yes. Mission driven and for profit. Very good. Okay. Okay. So, Jesse, what do you need from us? Are we gone through our questions and you need for us are you, to are you going to hear from the public at all megan or... of course of course okay. but i just want to make sure that we've exhausted <laughs> what she needs from us before i i move on to the the public 
So in your packet is a draft letter of support um, that is um, with your approval would be co-signed by the council and by me and then submitted on behalf of summit to the financiers. All That's, right. So it's the just question just... before you is, do you, do you sub submit a letter of support for the project or do you not? And with regard to, you know, support, what latitude do we have with regard to uh, having solar uh, be part of the project or all of that? Is that in our prerogative or is that something um, that would be seen more at the developmental review board level or I just want to know before we hand it over to the public to comment. So that's a great question and I may defer to Matt as I am not incredibly well versed yet in the land use regulations. Um, right, the question that I intended to bring to you was, do you want to submit a letter of support for this project for financing? There are many hoops the developer will still need to go through to get permitting for the project um, at, at the local level, at the state level, et cetera. So right now, I would, my recommendation would be to focus on, are you, support, are you supportive enough of the project as presented to allow them to move forward with financing? and then go through the rest of the permitting project, or are you not, um, and let them see if they can get financing without that community support. So I would stay out of conditions on it and let that be part of the permitting process. Thank you. Question I wanted to ask, and Andrew, did you want, he, he seems satisfied. All right, very good. All right, councils want to say anything before I hand it over to the public? To, okay, very good. So if you'd like to speak, please turn on your camera. And you're all very little right now, but I will do my best to recognize you. Okay, Roseanne, Roseanne Greco. Yes, thanks, Megan. Um, I understand what Jesse just said, and I understand that the way this development will be designed goes through the DRB. However, when a city council writes a letter, uh, it has power and it has direction. If you say something that your expectation is that this development will be net zero and that we have the technology to make net zero buildings, it doesn't have regulatory power, but it certainly has the power of influence. And it certainly says what you just talked about in your resolution, that you're going to look at everything with a climate um, crisis focus. 10 years ago, you know, we argued that we ought to put in our um, zoning regulations the requirement to use renewable sources of energy. But that was voted down or lobbied down by the developers because it costs them more money. In the long term, it saves the occupants money um, substantial uh, enough. And if you're talking about affordable housing, um, it will make it truly affordable. But just to encourage or hope or wish um, has not worked for the last 10 years or so. Look at the hundreds of houses that have been constructed because we didn't require it. You can have Energy Star appliances, but if you're still using fossil fuels, even if your house is well insulated, you're still using fossil fuels. So I really encourage you to put your money where your mouth is. You just, you just talked about reviewing things with a crisis, climate crisis in mind, and to punt this off, to the DRB, who is only going to follow what the zoning rule says, is to pretty much be silent. So, um, considering this development took down an entire forest, the least you could do is have them put solar panels on every roof. Doesn't have to be perfect, but they'll get energy. Uh, and I really encourage the council to do that. The question I have, though, is that a requirement that we can make in this letter? necessarily a requirement but it is an expectation you don't have to require it you can say our expectation is it will be um, environmentally responsible and will be net zero and will use renewable sources of energy it has no regulatory power but it certainly conveys a direction so. thank you Roseanne would anybody else like to speak Okay. All right. So we heard from one member of the public. Um, and we are, of course, 
very concerned um, that future actions um, must be taken, keeping in mind that uh, our resources are, are precious and limited and that we, we should move forward in order to reduce our carbon footprint, um, not just while reducing our carbon footprint, but in order to, that there is um, uh, an intention in, in, that, in that step that we take forward. That expectation is certainly there. Um, counselors, would you like to have that line added to the letter prepared by Jesse? I would not like to have that line prepared in the letter to Jesse. What what we're asking here is we're making a letter to VHCB, to Gus Seelig, saying that we support financing to get this critically needed affordable housing project moving in order to secure the financing to get this ahead of schedule. This is a great letter, and I would make a motion that we prove it as written. I, I would second that, but um, this is Tim Barrett. Um, I, I understand what Roseanne is saying, and we, whatever we put in that letter, if there's an additional sentence, um, you know, note of, sort of making the notice that this project should take uh, every possible opportunity to make itself as efficient and as productive of solar energy as possible, I think that tells the applicant and it tells the financing agency that we are looking at this through the lens of climate change. It might not have any regulatory effect on what actually happens on that building, but at least it puts the words in there. And, and we just did discuss all this earlier. Now, I don't, I don't know if Roseanne heard Tom say that they're all split units, so there aren't any um, natural gas furnaces for these units. They're all heat pump, right, Tom? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so that they're all heat pumps for heating and cooling, which is a significant advantage. And I don't know if there will be any natural gas combustion going on with the buildings in some other part. Uh, I'm assuming that your water heaters are also heat pump. Is that true, or do you know? Uh, as of now, it, the, the last building we did was gas for the for the hot water, um, water and heat, yeah. heat pumps for all the all the heating, both common yeah. areas and um, yeah. units. Yeah, are the water heaters are they? Um, Tank water heaters are on demand or? Uh, tank. Tank, okay. So, I mean, there is opportunity here and I think it's up to the council to at least state in the letter that we have an expectation that the developers are going to pursue um, the means necessary to adapt this building to to what the city wants to see for, for climate change action. And it'll have no, um, that ill effect, I think, on the application, it just it's it just makes a statement in the letter that we are looking at this and the developer should be looking at this. And for God's sakes, the housing finance agency should be looking at it as well, right? Great. So I agree I, with Tim. I think we should just at least put one or two sentences in it and and you know we can craft them right now and add them if that's okay. Unless and I think Go ahead. If I, I guess if, I, if you don't, or Megan, if you want to go ahead, I could just add one comment. Tim, did you finish your sentence? I, I thought you had, and I cut yeah, you I did. off. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Is it Tom or Tim? Um, yeah. I, my, my only concern with adding that is just that I, I do think that it would be, I guess it, it depends on the language, but we, it could be viewed as, you know, that these letters do get taken seriously by the financing agencies and if they said well the city's only supports this if it has solar um we the, they don't you know the vhcb and vhfa don't want to support projects that the city doesn't support it's 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 an important part of it um so i wouldn't want to represent to you tonight yes we will be putting solar on the roofs we did look at it at our last building with all the mini splits up there that it just did not it wasn't an efficient use of the space so i I, I I guess I just don't want to say something, make a representation to you that I'm not going to be able to tell you tonight that I can follow through on, and I, I wouldn't want you to put to undervalue the the you know the importance of the words you say in in a letter like this because they do get taken seriously, and um, so that, that that's my only comment on potential changes. 
And, and I will counter that, Tom, by saying that, you know, we're, we're not going to, in this one or two sentences, we're, we're not going to state exactly what it is that we would like to have. I think we're just going to make a statement that we are expecting the developer to take every opportunity that they can to construct this building in accordance with our climate action plan, which we are going to have in less than a year, we're hoping, <laughs> whatever that might be, right? But it, it does make a recognition of that fact within the letter. And I think it needs to be stated. It won't put any onus on you or requirement either to you or the finance agency. It just makes it clear that we have an expectation of you to, to do whatever you can. Could, and it, it gets could, the words in there about, you know, doing what we have to do. Could, could I make a suggestion? And, and um, <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't have the experience applying to VHCB on the, on these uh, applications. I, I wonder if maybe the language could be crafted around being as energy efficient as possible, as opposed to directing solar. Because I mean, we're we're finding the same issue. I mean, I never said when, that, Evan. I'm saying we should make it as as we 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 craft the sentence or two to say we expect the developer to be as proactive or whatever, however it's worded, to be as you know to take the actions necessary for energy efficiency, right, in order to be in accordance with South Brunton's climate action plan. Yeah, I, so I, I, it, well, it, I, I, I don't want to speak for Tom, but I think, you know, the, the, the directive of just going straight to solar, because if it's if it's not viable on the rooftop because you're left with such little space, it does become problematic if solar is referenced as opposed and I, to- I didn't say that we had to say solar. I mean, we've had a discussion about solar, but we're talking about just adding a, that sentence that that, that zeroes in on the fact that the city of South Burlington is ha, is going to have a, a finite action plan. We are in the process of generating it now. We have a resolution that we're going to sign off on Friday. And we just want people to understand that in this application to the financing agency, we we want to make that clear. That's all. May I? Tom. Yes, Tom. So Tim, I love what you're saying. I'm just curious. I, I don't want to jeopardize this affordable housing pursuit, but I, I wonder what we have done in the past is Kevin Dorn, our previous city manager, has testified, taken testimony representing the city during the DRB process, making similar statements. So would would that advocacy, that statement position, that, uh, that alignment, that uh, desire, however you just describe it, that expectation, uh, would that better be communicated and pressed during the DRB process and not necessarily in this letter about afford to advocate for affordable housing? Well, we certainly can, you know, like give testimony at a DRB meeting, but I mean, this letter to the, to the, um, the VHCB is a very important letter and, and it, it's well worded and it states how we support the plan. I'm just saying that maybe we should say it just before the end saying, and we expect the developers to take every opportunity possible to make this building as compliant with South Brendan's climate action plan as possible. And that's about as simple as I would make it. Because it does two things. It puts, it puts this application you know, on notice as being the first one that we we expect people to start to take our action plan seriously. We don't have it right now, but we're, we're gonna, <laughs> right? I, if I could just jump in here, and I see that that this housing is aligned with the city's goals. It is precisely the type of development our city wants and needs. And I think that it, it does behoove us to add in a, a sentence about about it without the mention of solar but with the the mention that our expectation is that this will be an energy efficient building uh in in line with our um climate action plan if if counselors are are favorable towards those three words or um our environmental goals within our plan since we haven't yet passed that climate action plan um I, I just want to note that it is close to a bus line. It is um, giving people the ability to, uh, you know, use alternate means of transportation. I, the article in the Free Press today about the color of the building in order to reflect uh, that that heat, I think, is something that would all work towards uh, what we're talking about here. 
Tom and Evan. So you could certainly in your application talk about you know the the proximity to to uh, a bus line and, and the alternate means of transportation that all of that is in keeping with South Burlington's goals. You could think about the color of the roof, have a reflective roof, think about a green roof perhaps instead of solar. I mean there are other ways um, in order for this project to you know just work towards a more sustainable future and that's that's our goal. I don't think Tim's intention is to be prescriptive but simply to keep it in everybody's mind that this is where we need to be going, that this is the precisely, that this is, you know, the, the in keeping with South Burlington's goals piece that just a mention I think would be welcome in my eyes without being an, an obstacle or without being too prescriptive. Is that something, Jesse, that, yes, feel free. So I guess sitting back and watching this conversation a little, um, and maybe I'm I'm too much of a of a compromiser, but I don't see a lot of disagreement between what the council is advocating for and what the developer is saying they're going to do. So I'm wondering if the solution to make the letter as uh, kind of effective as possible with the financers is the, a statement along adding a sentence along the lines of the council supports the developer's efforts to make this building as the, make these buildings as energy efficient as possible. So it's not directing, it's not seen by the financers as conditioning an approval. It's saying the developers are articulating a commitment to building the most energy efficient building as possible aligned to the city's goals and the council supports that effort. I, I find that to be language that I would like to have included. Absolutely. That's yeah, that sounds good. We, we we want to be encouraging Gus to look at this project and say the city council supports it, the developer supports it, they're going to provide affordable housing and they're going to be energy efficient, they're going to have a very low carbon uh, output. This is a great project and it's achieving the goals of our climate action plan and of our affordable housing plan. We need a, we need a positive letter of support without conditions or prescriptive measures. So I appreciate that, Jesse, and I would support that. Like to make a motion to that effect, Matt. Uh, Tom, did you have your hand raised? Okay. All good, thank you. Would you like to make a motion then? You have a motion, you can just amend it, Megan. Okay, would you like to amend uh, your motion then? Yeah, I made the motion and I would amend it to incorporate uh, the language Jesse Baker said about um, uh, you know, Jesse, you said so much more articulate than I can right now, but uh, that we are working with the developer. The developer is working to ensure that it does meet our goals of uh, a lower energy consumption, lower carbon um, uh, in, its, in, its, in its development. I don't know. How, however you said it, Jesse, it was much better. So that the council supports the development developer's goals of making this building as energy efficient as possible. There you go. That's it. Pretty simple. Yep. There a second. Second. All right, that was Tim. Okay, yes. very good. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, and I saw a thumbs up from, from Tom. And thank you. That was a very good discussion. And I think that this is going to be a, a, a very, I think, um, useful type of housing close to, to I think, of but will turn into quite an active, uh, an active um, uh, community, <laughs> and and is already an active community. So I I'm glad to to see this be part of it. Um, I just want you to know that my computer is starting in two minutes, uh, without any control on my part. If could we take a five minute pause here, and I will be back on in five minutes. I just and want to I say one is... more thing to, to Tom oh, and Evan. That th thank you for your time tonight. But I just want to I want to really impress upon you the fact that every kilowatt hour in the summertime that's used to cool a building that is not recaptured by having a solar panel somewhere to generate that power is a complete missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a second. Every kilowatt hour that you use to cool a building and you don't have a solar panel to capture that back 
is a total waste. And I hope that you take every opportunity on that hillside farm to find some space to put some solar panels, not just on the private homes, but on those big buildings, especially those commercial buildings. And you better start looking really hard because that's what the city is going towards, is trying to find the teeth to get this to happen on all future developments, all right? I just want to put that out there right now. I'm all for this letter and I'm for your project, but it's about time that we make the decision to put the solar where our mouths are, all right? Thank you. I appreciate your passion, Tim. I share it. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, counselors. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be back in about a minute. Okay. I think we're all here. Has everyone been able to get something to eat and walk around a little bit? And Fish all right. <laughs> so we're now going to have a, a motion, I hope, for a possible executive session to consider oh. pending or probable litigation to which the city is a party and confidential attorney-client communication for the purpose of providing professional legal services regarding the same. So moved. Taking, bringing with us who? Oh no, we have to, then the second motion, right? I'll second the first motion on determination. Yeah, so the- Go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, so yeah, so the first motion would be, uh, Council move that premature public knowledge of the item discussed in the agenda that uh, you just read it, Megan, um, to enter into a possible executive session to consider pending a probable litigation to which the city is a party and confidential attorney client communications for the purpose of providing professional legal services regarding same would put this council at a substantial disadvantage. I'll move that. I'll second it. Good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then the second motion would just be to move into executive session for the purposes outlined in the first motion. And, and, and inviting in who? Uh, Jesse, Amanda, and myself. And city council? Yes. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so moved. There's second. Tom, did you second? Okay. Second, second by Tom. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's all of us. Okay, and we will be back in half an hour. Should we ask Sue to stay on for other business then? Jesse, what do you suggest? Um, I don't know what your past practice is. This is my first in, like this virtual executive session with you. I'm happy to take notes during other business and provide that to you, Sue, if that would be helpful. That's fine. I can go Very watch the baseball game. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and, and nobody, nobody said anything for other business. So my my guess is that nothing will pop up. Right. Okay. Just get me a closing time for the meeting would be fine. Absolutely, Sue.